Hello, welcome to the Unexceptional Moms podcast. This is episode 19. Today we're going to be talking about PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm Erin Lorraine. And I am Ellen Strembo. And our guest today is Jolene Bilo, and I'm so excited for her to be here. Jolene and I met eight years ago at a writer's conference, and her first book had just come out. So I'm just going to tell you, Jolene is amazing, and she's incredible. And actually, it was a conversation that I had with Jolene um, about life, and she was the first one that asked me, she said, Ellen, have you heard about PTSD? And that kind of got the, the role going for my family, thanks to her. So um, you're going to get to get to know her, but I, she does have five books, and most of her listeners, you're all special needs parents, and these are all books for you. <laughs> so she has A Different Dream for My Child, a, tr- a Different Dream Parenting, The Caregiver's Notebook, Every Child Welcome, which I have to say, Every Child Welcome, every single church in the United States should have that book. Mm. Because every single children's minister or youth minister needs that book. And I feel like the pastors need to read it too so that they can learn. And I did a podcast with... Um, Jolene and Katie, who is her co-writer, about it because it's one of the best books out there for children's ministry. And her newest book is Thus My Child Have PTSD. Um, So Jolene, welcome. Thank you for having me, Erin and Ellen. Yes. Oh, and before we forget the freebie. Oh, yes. The freebie. The freebie is incredible. Amazing. Um, Yes. Jolene has given us a PDF called, all right, let me make sure I get this exactly right, PTSD in Children Primer. And it is really incredible and comprehensive. And um, if after listening to this, you start to wonder about PTSD in your own family or you want more information, there is no better place. Now, here's the catch. You need to go look at it by March 15th because as of March 15th, we are going to pull it off of the um, website and we're going to replace it with a link where you will be able to purchase it. And it's a very small fee, but get your hands on it now because it is incredible. Yeah. We've had some really good freebies and Jillian's when we talked about mental health was really good. And now Jillian's freebie was like, <laughs> you just, wow. So it is really amazing. When I saw it, I thought, this is really good. Yeah. It's really, really good. And once you have the primer, you're going to want to get her book. Of course. I mean, you will. Um, So um, what we're going to be talking about today, we are, uh, you know, Jolene is going to share her story. We're going to talk about what PTSD is, PTSD in children, PTSD in parents. And that's uh, the rough outline, but we're just going to talk. Yeah. (laughs) So... So Jolene, I mean, share with us, why were you even writing about PTSD? Why are you so passionate about it? Well, I have to blame it on my child. You know how it is. (laughs) How else do any of us get into special needs ministry? It begins with our kids. And our first child was born in 1982. Um, I'd had a fairly normal pregnancy. We lived in Western South Dakota uh, when he was born. We were two miles from Montana, 20 miles from North Dakota, in a town of 92 people. When we moved there in 1977, there were no paved roads going into that town, including the state highway. Now the state highway is paved. It, we had a 90-mile trip down for our son's birth, and the first 55 miles of that were gravel, just to give you an idea of where we were living and what we were dealing with. <laughs> and we made it to the hospital for his delivery, just barely. And um, we didn't know anything was wrong until the middle of the night. My husband would come in and say, you know, there's a lot of people around his little bassinet in the nursery, and they've got him elevated. And in the morning, the doctor came in and said, "Um, he's having some trouble breathing. We've done an x-ray. We can't figure it out. We'd like to send him to Rapid City. Our son was born in Spearfish. We'd like to send him to Rapid City to see what's going on. So uh, he was maybe eight hours old, and we sent him on his way. And we, I got a call about 11 in the morning. My husband had gone to an acquaintance's house to take a shower and, you know, because we realized things were going to be happening uh, in some way or another. And so I got this call all by myself saying, and I had to be wheeled out to the nurse's station because in the olden days, 
there were not cell phones and there were not even phones in the rooms, individual phones. There was only the phone out in the big nurses area. So um, I was wheeled out there and this doctor I had never met before said, we know what's wrong with your child. He has a tracheal esophageal fistula. And he explained to me then that that meant that his esophagus came down from his throat and formed a blind pouch. It came up from his stomach and hooked into his trachea. Um, he also said it was, of all the major birth defects, it had the highest um, success rate for surgical repair. But they needed to send our son immediately to either um, Omaha or Denver for surgery. And which place did we want him to go? And I said, can I just wait and um, talk to my husband? And the doctor said, no, we need to get him there as fast as we can. The sooner he gets there, the fewer the complications. Well, you know, by this time, I'm a hot mess. And um, all I could think was, well, my family's in Iowa and Omaha's closer to Iowa than Denver is. Um, so we sent him to Omaha. We got word before midnight that night that he had made it through the surgery. We got there a couple days later. He was in NICU for about two and a half weeks, rock star recovery. We took him home. At two months, he had um, complications that meant we had to be life flighted to Omaha again, another surgery, feeding tube, all sorts of issues over the next five years. Um, at the end of that five years, he was pretty in pretty good condition. Um, nobody who met him would have realized there was anything going on with him, but he had had a total of seven surgeries and I don't, I've lost count of how many procedures, you know, medical tests, procedures and different things. We moved when he was three to Iowa where we live now because we finally realized maybe it would be a good idea to be closer to doctors than out where we were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he had a normal growing up. He was the kind of kid everybody loved and, um, Life was good until he was 15. He had to have a final surgery where they removed two thirds of his lower esophagus. And then everything was okay until shortly after his 18th birthday, he ran away for the first time. And when he came back, he couldn't explain why. That began a series of running. And I don't like to go into a lot of detail about that because it's his life as an adult and he's doing well now. But um, finally at the end of, uh, of six years of running here and running there for different purposes, he called us and said, can you help me? I can't get a job. I can't do anything. I can't have a relationship until I figure out what's wrong with me. And truly by the grace of God, he was in West Virginia then, truly by the grace of God, um, we were led to a, one of the top facilities in the country, which was just three hours away from where he is now. It's called Intensive Trauma Therapy, and it's located in Morgantown, West Virginia, where they do a week of intensive um, of therapy, and he had to go through some assessments beforehand where they determined that what he was dealing with was post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. caused by all of those early surgical interventions. Um, so I went with him. I was able to be with him during that treatment week. We stayed in a motel and I would take him to the center every day. And um, the interesting thing was it was two weeks before that first book you mentioned, A Different Dream for My Child, oh, wow. before it was due to the publishers. So I had my proofs along and I was going over them. Or not, it wasn't the proofs, but going over my last edit and realized as the week went on that I had to put something in there about PTSD, which I got in there and sent it off for one of the devotions. It's a devotional, sent it off. Um, but during that week, what I learned about what was going on with, with our son was quite fascinating. And I remember at one time that the psychiatrist coming in and saying to me, well, while I was waiting for Alan, he said, well, what about you, mom? How are you doing? And I'm like, well, that's a weird question. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to have my first book published. I've had a long career as a teacher. My kids are grown, you know. And I'm like, well, I'm fine and just kind of didn't think of it again for, for quite a while. Well, our son came back, and his life is going much better now. He does very well. He's graduated from college. He's got a family. He's um, got a, a new job that he enjoys very much. Um, and, but a couple years later, our daughter brought home the man who would soon be her husband. And in visiting with him, we found out that he had dealt with some really – issues. He had seen his younger brother die in a playground accident when he was five. Mm -hmm. yeah. His parents had gone through a difficult divorce and he was the oldest and, you know, kind of took a lot of the fallout. And he was seeing a therapist and I said to him, you know, I think you should really go 
go to this website and fill out their forms and see if you maybe have PTSD and they could help you. Well, he didn't like hearing me say that, but two months later he called and he said, um, I didn't want you to keep mentioning that to me. So I went and I got their assessment and I filled it out. And now they say, yes, they can help me because I do have PTSD. So this was about six months before they got married. So my, um, so they asked me, my daughter and future son-in-law asked me to go with them for treatment. And this time I thought, there is a book in this and there is stuff I need to learn. So I made a list of questions and I asked them beforehand, can I come in and interview all of you clinicians, you know, during that week? And I took my recorder and I, so that was the beginning of it. And then I just started reading everything I could find about PTSD and children and reading, um, studies that are done, you know, research and finding all of that and thinking, you know, it's also hard to read. It's all written in um, mental health language. Mm. And so many, and whenever I would talk to anyone about my son having PTSD, I got the same answer all the time. Well, isn't that just for veterans? Mm. Isn't mm -hmm. that just for combat veterans? Yeah. And, you know, then when they would hear the story and I started speaking about it some and, and just kept pushing kind of had an idea for a book idea and it took me a while before I, I wrote a proposal, finally got a publisher who would, would publish it. So it came out in October of 2015 and it actually got a starred review by Publishers Weekly, which just, you know, they had to pick me up off the floor after that one because it's not like the <laughs> kind of book that everybody rushes to the shelves to get. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's my story. That's how I started writing about it. And I'm, um, you know, I'm just an ordinary mom talking mm -hmm. about, what has been put in my path and what I've learned from it in the hopes that other parents can recognize it sooner and get treatment for their kids mm -hmm. when they're five or six or seven, instead of when they're 26. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a good but point. even if you, if it doesn't happen until they're 26, that's, There's I still mean, hope. It's, it's still yeah. hope. You can yes. still change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just in general, what is PTSD? I mean, we're talking about it. So what is PTSD? Okay, well, we need to start with what is trauma because PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. So the trauma in there. And a trauma is anything that happens to a child or an adult that overwhelms them physically, emotionally, and mentally. And the key word there is overwhelms. For a little while, your system just can't handle what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Now, we all go through trauma. All of us experience traumas. We can think back to those things that were traumatic, maybe the death of someone or you were in a car accident or, you know, you went through something really scary, but not all of us develop PTSD. And PTSD is what I like to call trauma's bigger, meaner cousin. Mm -hmm. Because, and I like to liken it to the difference between a cut and an infected wound. Because we all get cuts. Everybody gets a cut, but not everybody gets an infection. Why don't we get an infection? Well, because we take the time with that cut to clean it out, mm. to put some disinfectant on it, to make sure there's no gravel cut in there, you know, to bandage it up, to check it every day, make sure it gets some sunshine. And so it heals normally because we've paid attention to that cut and we've given it the attention it needs to, to just heal itself. Hmm. So when we have a child that goes through a trauma, if they've got a loving adult with them, someone who's going to help them process that trauma that they went through, let them talk about it, let them process it over and over, make sure that nothing's still stuck in their brain. Eventually that energy that's caused by the trauma, you know, that adrenaline brush and that energy that can get trapped in your brain gets processed and gets out and they can go on with their life. There might be a little mark, you know, that's always there. Right. But it's not, it's just a superficial thing. It's not major. But PTSD is when that trauma or a series of trauma are allowed to just stay in the brain and fester. Because in that state of overwhelm, that trauma gets stuck in our right brain. And our right brain is where we see and, and experience things visually, um, through feelings and sensations, through sounds, through smells, but not through words. And so if that trauma gets stuck in that brain and can't get out and get processed and over to the left side of the brain where you can talk about it and give it a narrative so it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, 
it'll fester there and it'll, it'll just cause that same fear reaction anytime there's a similar trigger. Mm -hmm. Something similar happens to what happened at the beginning of that trauma. And if those symptoms where it's re-triggered and um, things like not being able to sleep at night and um, being scared of the same thing, avoiding different things, um, being in a state of hyperarousal, if that continues more than three months after the original trauma, the DSM diagnoses that then as PTSD uh -huh. and someone needs treatment. <clears throat> but if there's been somebody there that's come alongside that child and helped them process it, and Dr. Peter Levine in his book, uh, Taming the Trauma Tiger, I think is the name of it, he has these steps for trauma PTSD or trauma first aid kit. And he kind of goes through, and in my book, PTSD for Children, I kind of give examples of it using his method, where you sit with the child and you allow them time to just, um, to just think, and then you let them talk about it. You let them talk about it over and over. You ask them how they're feeling. You give them time to rest. You come back. You talk about it as much as you need. You watch their bodily cues. If there's somebody who can do that with them, those events may not turn into PTSD. So that's the difference between the two. One is like a festering emotional wound, PTSD, that just won't go away because it's never been tended to. And the other is just that little scar on your hand. And it's, you know, a memory, but it doesn't hmm. affect you. Okay, that has to be the best explanation I've ever heard of PTSD. I know. <laughs> Um, so I do want to touch on something that you said, Jolene, because you said, you know, if a child has loving parents, but you were a loving parent. Oh, very good. And I'm a loving parent and Erin is a loving parent. Yes. And even when you have loving parents, you can still have a child who ends up having PTSD. And there are four risk factors for that, especially for very young children. Let's see if I can pull them all up. One is the age of the child when that trauma occurs. So and the younger they are, the more likely they will be traumatized. How oh. old was my son? 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And he was in an operating room alone. We didn't know at the time, but we found out since then he didn't even have any anesthesia because before 1986, newborns um, in pediatric surgery were not given anesthesia because they didn't think those babies had pain. Wow. I know. So he was given a paralytic drug to hold still, but he had the excruciating pain wow. of a surgery with, with major wounds. And anybody who had surgery, in, surgery at birth before 1986 probably has that same kind of trauma inside them in some way or another. So um, the younger they are when that trauma occurs, it could be like you know being taken away from your birth mother and put in an orphanage, or mm -hmm. it could be anything, even in utero, if a, a baby is hearing the parents fight all the time or whatever, and there's physiological things. There's been a study that um, of mothers who were pregnant when the Twin Towers fell, mm -hmm. and uh, the further they, a, a good number of them, if the mothers develop PTSD from being in Manhattan during that time, their children had a great a much greater likelihood of developing PTSD also. Wow. So, um, so that being very young is one factor. Mm -hmm. multiple, multiple traumas is um, another factor. The more traumas you have, you know, and so these kids that are in an orphanage or whatever, they, it's daily for them, you know, especially if they were in one of the maybe um, Eastern European orphanages where there wasn't much care given. Like or my kids. son, mm -hmm. yeah, repeated medical issues. Repeated um, medical issues. If, if the situation is um, an unexpected rather than scheduled, you know, like especially this would be true with medical or dental things. You know, if you have to go in for medical treatment that's not expected and you can't prepare a child, it's more likely. Right. Same with dental or anything else. And I can't remember what the fourth one is. Um, but anyway, there are reasons. And the main reason, I think, for when our children are very young and they experience these things is they have no words. Any child that right. experiences this before age three, when they become verbal, their only way of accessing those memories, the only way of recalling them is nonverbal. And so they are much more likely to develop PTSD because how can you say to them, 
even when they're older, what was it you were going through? How did you feel? They don't have any words for their feelings. They don't have any words for right. what they experience. Yeah. Right. And so, and, and that's when you really have to get them, I think, to someone who's a professional who can access those memories and help them process them, um, those nonverbal memories, and then help them come up with a story for what happened to them so they do have a narrative that they can repeat when they feel those hmm. same triggered feelings coming on. Which is really interesting that you bring that up because the therapist that we see, um, that's something that she has helped my daughter to come up with a narrative. Yes. You know, and that's something that she has said, you know, everything is so scattered before she had a family. So what is the narrative before so that she mm -hmm. can understand and make sense of it? And that was a question I asked the psychiatrist where our son was treated. You know, I was like, well, what do you do if you don't know right. what the trauma is that they went through? And he said, well, as long as you come up with something very basic that helps them explain it. He said a lot of times if it's young men who don't know what happened to them, he just deals with circumcision, you know, and they make a story for that that helps them calm all those parts of themselves that are being traumatized. He's used the birth story too, because, you know, he's like the way most people, most babies have been birthed since what the, when they started doing all the births in the hospital and, mm -hmm. you know, that's a pretty traumatic thing for, for everybody. And so you can work that story and come up with a narrative for it that helps them process those emotions. So mm -hmm. that, that seems really, I don't yeah. quite understand that, but, it works. And, you know, I think what's interesting, especially for those of us who parent kids with disabilities or kids who are medically fragile, you think, one, my daughter has had lots of surgeries mm -hmm. and she had surgeries before she came home being, you know, an orphan in Ukraine and they don't treat orphans in Ukraine very well. Mm -hmm. um, right as Aaron can attest to that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're talking about no pain medication, no anesthesia, mm -hmm. stuff like that, not even babies, but even when they're older, because mm -hmm. they're just, you know, the orphans. Um, but even unexpected medical issues, I mean, we all know parents who have kids who are medically fragile and medical emergencies are unfortunately mm -hmm. part of their life. Very common. So mm -hmm. you have this kid, you know, kids who are dealing with a lot of trauma because of, I mean, because of the medical um, interventions, because of the medical emergencies that surround mm -hmm. their condition. And you have parents who are dealing with that too, because mm -hmm. it's not the primary, but it's secondary. And we were talking a little bit before we started doing that, but both Erin and I have a secondary PTSD diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, which you know, how does that happen? You know, that I could say I don't experience everything firsthand, let's say with surgeries or stuff like that, but, but I get to be in the end of, I feel like I can't do anything for my child, you know, or right. because I don't, you know, medically, maybe I can't, or then I'm caring for a child who is what we refer to as, you know, trauma brain, mm -hmm. you know, trying to process that and then how that affects you know, me as a parent as well. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, when you're talking about the, the wound, you know, parent, you know, like a loving parent that helps a child clean the wound. I think sometimes you have a child with a wound and then you have the parent with the wound and yeah. everything is still happening. Yeah. But there's no time to stop and say, okay, do I need to clean it up? You know, what, right. what do I need to do? And then you're there's no time to process it. Right. Yeah. Because you're always in crisis mode. Yes, because my wound is more direct um, in Oksana's worst periods of her mental health crisis. I was physically and emotionally abused by her for a long, long time. And I was, I was in crisis mode. I had four children to care for mm -hmm. um, and a marriage to care for so that we survived through this. And there was no time for processing. Mm -hmm. I just had to survive. Exactly. And then when you throw the, the grief and loss aspect yes, of it absolutely. also, you know, even though even our children have, are living, but there are so many things that we didn't get to experience with them or absolutely. that they don't get to experience, you know, and that's a stress too, that, that just keeps 
festering. And, and so we do end up with secondary PTSD. And um, I would add to that for me, the stress of trying to get her help. Our mental yeah, health system oh yeah. is such a mess. And yes. the stress of fighting and fighting and fighting, not just to help her, but help our whole family. I mean, we yes. were crumbling and no one would help us. It was all about money, you know, and beds yeah. open. Yeah. It very is. stressful. It's very, very stressful. Yeah. yeah. And the sad part about it is, which is also the hopeful part, um, one of my favorite quotes came from uh, the, one of the people at the clinic where our son was treated. And she said, you know, there's a lot of thinking right now that the three ring binder of mental illnesses would become a pamphlet if after trauma happened, we treated it. Mm. and helped people process it because their feeling was that about 90% of mental illness is trauma-based. Interesting. I there, are, there are some that aren't, mm -hmm. of right. course, but you know, when you look at the vast scope of things, I think anything dealing with um, anxiety, mm -hmm. anything dealing with uh, not all depression, but some depression, mm -hmm. um, addictions and and eating disorders, um, a, a good number of those different things, uh, um, obsessive compulsive, many, many of those are trauma-based. Well, those let me ask you this. are coming out of trauma. If I'm a parent and I'm parenting a child with special needs, um, what, what kind of signs would I look for if I think I might be dealing with some PTSD as well? Of your own? Yes. Um, I would say um, you'd be, as a parent, you'd be looking for like, where are my, when do I make like way out of control responses to mm -hmm. things? Mm -hmm. When are my responses not appropriate to the event that's happening? Even if it is a stressful event, like, and, and for me that came a couple years ago when, when um, our son was dealing with some issues and I just was like, I was just in a panic mode. I felt just, I just would cry. And I felt like I was just, um, you know, losing him all over again. It was like mm -hmm. I was back in that hospital bed and they told me he had to go, you know, to another hospital and I couldn't do anything for my child. You mm -hmm. know, it was to, so it was that, and I would just start crying. And I was talking to my sister about that. And she is a mental health counselor in, in uh, St. Paul. And we talked and she reassured me and I was crying and crying and we hung up and two minutes later, she called me back and she said, okay, now I was like doing, I was in sister mode when I was talking with you about this, but now I put my counselor hat on and I think you're probably dealing, you need to get your trauma process. You never had a chance yeah. to process anything from when your son was born and you probably could use some EMDR treatment. She said, mm -hmm. I think that's probably what would do it. And I did, I did about three months then of EMDR. She helped me and find can a- Can you tell, can you tell area. people what is uh, EMDR? Let's, whoops, there, I just lost you, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can remember it. It's eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it is a form of treatment, trauma treatment that, that works and it's one of the most uh, research documented that it is effective, but nobody knows why. And it was discovered in, I think it was the 80s or the early 90s, where this woman had gone through a trauma, and I think she was some kind of counselor in New York City. And so she went out for a walk, and she noticed on her walk that if, when she was moving her eyes in a certain way, the trauma somewhat receded, and she was able to process it better. And, um, and, and that involved having her eyes go back and forth to the right and the left. And she started working with this with clients and, and found that it was very effective. And what they think happens, it's kind of like your REM sleep eye movements, mm -hmm. which is when we process the day, you know, in our dreams, it's similar to that. And what it does is it, it starts when you have a trauma and when you develop PTSD, um, the, the connections in your corpus callosum that connect your right brain to your left brain get broken. Trauma breaks those. And somehow with this eye movement going right and left, right and left, it starts repairing those connections. 
And hmm. so somehow you're, you're doing this right and left movement while you're talking with a trained therapist about what you went through. And then you pay attention to what your body is feeling and you start thinking about it more and, and just going through the story and letting those emotions finally um, be expressed and then kind of come out of it. It's really unusual. Now I have, um, I have some eye coordination issues. So I told my therapist, I'm like, I will be concentrating so hard on making my eyes go the right way. I won't be able to process anything. Seriously, mm -hmm. this is an issue I've had and I've had to go through with an eye doctor when I was a kid, you know, working on not jerky movements. She said, oh, no problem. I can just tap on your knees back and forth. Oh, it doesn't matter as long as we have that cross modality from left to right so that your brain starts moving, we can do it that way. And so, of course, then after I was done, I'm like, okay, so now I need more information for you because I'm writing this book. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, how young do you do this? And she said, well, she works with toddlers as soon as they're verbal. I said, well, how do you, you can't get them to do this. She said, no. But she said, I have these little balls that are like vibrating balls. Have you ever seen those? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you put them in their pockets and they vibrate back and forth. Huh. And work them through the story with play therapy more than with, uh -huh. you know, just narrating it. And so EMDR has proven to be very effective with helping process those memories. So Didn't uh, Nina do EMDR? Um, no, what she did was neurofeedback. Oh, okay. um, that's but another one. Say, yeah, but, you know, mm -hmm. it is having, I don't know, she called it the beeps because you could hear the beep. Um, and I would say when she did therapy, wow receiving neurofeedback, I mean, that really opened up a whole lot of emotions. I feel like our most effective therapy times happened when she was receiving neurofeedback, <laughs> which um, when we were going through a really rough patch, um, you know, you know, you, your, your child has a really good therapist when a therapist calls you and they say, so I'm a little bit concerned about you, mom. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think, you, yeah. need to, you know, would you consider doing some neurofeedback as well? Yeah. Um, because again, I mean, we've talked about trauma affects everyone in the family, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. the person. absolutely. And I think, Jolene, when you when you said about when you when you react really big, I think that there are times that I find myself um, that I snap. But it's not just like mm -hmm. you know, like as a mom, sometimes you snap. It's like out of control, out of proportion mm -hmm. response. Yeah. And For me, all Oksana has to do is whine. I mean, yeah. just that itty bitty indicator that she is potentially going to lose control and everybody system in me starts flaring sure. up. My heart starts racing. My breathing gets shallow and fast. I start sweating. Um, so it's like you were saying, it's that over the top response. And often it's just the smallest thing that might bring you back to the fear that something will happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or remind you of something because Andy and I were talking about this and, um, you know, as he is getting ready to be a mental health counselor, but we were talking about um, the trauma response, the triggers. And I mentioned that sometimes for me, it's crying. Then my first instinct when my daughter cries, sometimes it's not to be the loving mother. Right. Because for me, my experiences of the crying was you are a foreigner to me. I don't know who you are. I don't want you to touch mm -hmm. me. I don't want you to be close to me. I, I was a very scary person. So even now that is my first response. It's this incredible rejection. And of course I'm not thinking, Oh, the crying reminds me of when I felt so rejected by my child. It's more, the crying reminds me of all those emotions that I was mm -hmm. dealing with at the time. So I respond with it. And that is always, and I know you're not supposed to say always, but I feel like that's always my first response. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, I have to be very conscious to say, yes. this is a very appropriate time for her to be crying. You know, she just fell and she hit her head, you know? So, but the fact that that happens first, mm -hmm. you know, is a sign that there is some trauma that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Our son, of course, what yes. happened. Our son had many, many feeding issues, as you can imagine, you know, with his esophagus and right. just trying to get him when he first started solid food, it was like the most traumatizing thing for us because he, he wasn't, didn't, hadn't gained enough weight. We needed to get more food into him. Mm. He had an oral aversion. So he would sit and go, we'd have the spoon of food and he'd be going 
And my husband would like dance around the kitchen to get Alan to smile. And then I would, you know, open his mouth and laugh. And then I would shove the food in. So it was like, we just hated yeah. him. Yeah. So our daughter is six years younger. And when she was about six or eight months old, my mom was visiting one weekend and she's like, you know, she's ready for solid food. And we're, right. I, mean, I couldn't even do it. Right. My mom had to get the rice cereal and mix it up. And we just sat and watched my mother feed our daughter this rice cereal and our daughter just ate it up. And we were just like open mouthed. So any kinds of feeding things like that bugged us. And then the one that still will get me sometimes, um, our son's teenage years were somewhat turbulent, you know, and so getting a phone call from him usually meant something was wrong. Mm, and mm -hmm. to this day when he calls, and I hear, hi, mom. It's like you, Ellen, where it's mm -hmm. like my first response is, oh. What happened? What uh -huh. happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, he's fine. You know, yeah. he's, he's doing okay. But I don't know when I'll get over that. Maybe never. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but you know, those aren't ones that totally, those little things don't like keep me from living my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are things I can talk through because I've processed them. Mm -hmm. PTSD is an issue when it starts impacting your life to the point where you can't function and your relationships um, mm -hmm. are failing. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Erin, everything's crumbling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's when it's like, we got to do something. You know, it's really interesting because we have a lot of trauma that surrounds uh, falling, which makes sense for my daughter with mm -hmm. trauma policy because when she falls, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Um, but I think I even have trauma from her fall. So I think about one time where she, she fell down the stairs mm. and I have anxiety issues and stairs for all my kids and for myself have always been a big deal. Like if people notice, if there's a railing, I hold on to a railing at stairs. I don't know why, but she fell down the stairs one time and you know, it was one of the, like, we had seen her on the last step and all of a sudden she was gone. So she fell all the way down, mm. which was super, I mean, that creates a lot of trauma for her later. Um, but even for me to, to see my child, you know, mm -hmm. rolling down when you don't have that. And I remember uh, in my mind, my husband leapt from the top step to the bottom one. I cannot, I, you know, I tried to play that and I, in my mind, it, it was one big, huge leap. I'm sure he went one foot at a time, but that's how I remember it mm -hmm. to get to her because he was with her. And I was so um, out of control. I was running up and down the stairs, just going, is she okay? Is she okay? Like I, I couldn't look, I couldn't concentrate. I could, you know, because I was incredibly scared. Well, then my reaction, you can imagine exactly. how that made my daughter mm -hmm. feel. Right. And, right. um, and I, w I was so, you know, irrational and I remember grabbing her from my husband and I was crying and crying and she's crying and, and I almost feel like, um, the, the trauma that she already had from falls and the, you know, the trauma that maybe I had created, you know, from that, it's almost like it, it intensifies. So as I think about the wounds, you know, it's like, instead of cleaning the wounds, I went, well, let's see what happens if we add salt to it, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> or, yes. Right. Yes, exactly. Or let's and one of the main the things, a bit more. one of the main things, recommendations for helping children avoid trauma and especially young ones deal with it is that their caregiver, their primary caregiver needs to be calm. And if yes. they have a calm and compassionate caregiver watching over them, they're much less likely to develop trauma. You know, I have pictures of us, like our son had this string that went down his mouth and through his esophagus and out his stomach tube hole for six months. And when they took it out, I'm there, he's on this little gurney in a diaper and the doctor's pulling it out. I'm taking pictures. I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know? I don't know. In this day and age, you yeah. can post them on Facebook too. So. Right. And it's like, <laughs> what? Yeah, that's right. I should have been rubbing his leg. Of course, they wouldn't let you then. They didn't let the parent. But now, if I was a parent in that situation, because these things still happen to kids with our son's condition, I would be right down next, next to my son, lying or, you know, kneeling singing in his ear and whispering to him and rubbing his leg so he knew that he had somebody with him 
-hmm. you know, to keep it from being so traumatizing. Hmm. So uh, we've talked about, you know, a bit about EMDR and neurofeedback, but ultimately, what do you do? What do you do when you and or your child, um, you suspect or definitely do have PTSD? Is it ultimately a therapy thing? Um, it, it, if it's PTSD, yes, I would say you need to get some kind of a therapy. Now, depending on how entrenched that PTSD is and how, you know, if it's like you choked once and so you have a fear of, you choked once on a piece of candy when you were in the car, so you have a fear of eating in the car, mm -hmm. you know, that's a pretty easy one to treat. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's something broader, you probably would be looking at treatment options. I mean, would we ever think um, if our child had uh, broke a leg, would we say, well, we'll just wait and see how it goes before right. we treat that. You right. know? Just like we would treat a physical wound or a physical condition like diabetes in a child. We need to, we need to have that same um, level of advocacy and, mm -hmm. and going to seek treatment for mental illness too. And the good news is that PTSD is highly treatable. And people can learn to cope with it and, you know, what to do when their triggers come and can get to a point where they function extremely well, you know, and it, it kind of is like a, it's a piece of their life they have to manage, but it's not their whole life right. anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you would be looking for treatment. And, and that could treatment. include, I'm assuming, medication. It could, but, you know, I wouldn't start there. Right. It, it would have to be in conjunction with therapy. Right. 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 Um, um, uh, but I would be looking first for some kind of a treatment that is not word-based. So cognitive behavioral therapy, even trauma-focused CBT, which is the most common kind of treatment, mm -hmm. is totally talk-based. And if that's your primary treatment for someone who's getting therapy for PTSD, it's not going to be effective mm -hmm. because you have to start accessing those nonverbal memories. Mm -hmm. So whatever your treatment is has to have some component of... Um, of nonverbal treatment. So the neurofeedback, the EMDR, um, the kind of treatment my son went through where he actually did guided imagery um, and then did art therapy and, to create a narrative at hmm. play therapy with kids where they're allowed right. to act out what's gone on. Hmm. And there's many others. There's a great new book out, um, The Body Keeps the Score. What's the name? Basil Vanderkolk. He's like the He's been in PTSD treatment, uh, a, ther or a, a pioneer in the field since the 60s. And he's just recently released a book detailing all the different things he's researched and what worked and what didn't. Hmm. And it's fascinating. And you'll, you, I learned so much. I was like, whoa, I sure wish I'd had that before mm -hmm. <laughs> I wrote my book. But there are things called internal family systems is another one. If you're dealing with a lot of like family abuse issues. Um, that is your trauma. Uh, he, yoga can be an, a very effective mm. treatment. Um, and, and just many, many more. And there is an aspect, of course, you're trying to get it to where those bodily sensations, feelings, um, smells, images, where they are moved from being in that form in your right brain. You want to move them to your left brain so they're a narrative that has a beginning, middle, end. Um, there, there are a number of those that do that. And at some point, then talk does come into it. Right. But that's not your starting place. Okay. It's never the starting place. No, that's very interesting because honestly, I don't think that I would have ever considered that. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I, I think about it, when, you know, when I have gotten counseling, it's always been talk therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, Erin, mm -hmm. but it seems to be what's most available. But it, it, is. But it does make sense to me. You know, it really does. I mean, I'm even thinking about, um, because I'm sure a lot of people have thought about that, you know, all of us at some point, you know, maybe have said, I will never be like my mother. Um, <laughs> but not, you know, but and I'm giving this as a really, sim you know, simple example. So, so let's say that maybe there was some trauma associated with that. You know, when I was a child, this happened and it was scary and I didn't have any way to process it. And then you grow up and you're like, oh no, I have become my mother. Um, you know, because we're reacting the same way. So, yes, you know, 
that example just made me think, I wonder how often, you know, that's exactly what happens. One person has trauma. You don't recognize what it is. So then you respond with trauma and maybe you just think we just fight all the time. You know, why is the, why is this relationship so difficult when in reality, maybe you're dealing with two people that are acting out of trauma. Mm. Does that make sense? Exactly. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I wonder how often some relationships are not just hard relationships and not, you're not just dealing with someone who's difficult and just someone that's being irrational. You're mm-hmm. dealing with someone, you know, or it's a situation where it's coming out of that trauma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and when we only talk about it with our counselor or with that person, it's like going back to that infected wound idea. It's like, if we just talk about it, we're only at the surface and we're, we're we can clean up that surface and we can cover it with a band-aid by talking about it. But until we go in deep and clean out the infection, you yeah. know, we, we're not going to, and to get in deep, you have to do something that's not um, talk based. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's lots of things. Hypnosis is another one that works too. Mm-hmm. You know, Jillian, I remember, um, been fascinated because you had shared with me at some point that your son through guided therapy, and I can't remember, he was able to actually go and remember or to yes. see things that mm-hmm. when he didn't have the language to describe it. Right. Mm-hmm. It was very interesting. Yeah. He, he went through hypnosis and they actually, for his first session, the, the um, doctor, the psychiatrist who was guiding him through that uh, asked me to come in because Alan was in so many hospitals in that first day and he wanted to make sure he was guiding him correctly. And yeah, there was a time where uh, the doctor said, are you in the operating room? And our son was like, yes, well, what's it like? And he described it and started to become kind of upset about that little baby being mm-hmm. hurt. And the doctor said, can you find, look around and find a place to move back to so you're not so, you know, so emotional. And he was able to do that because they're, their, um, their big warning is we never want to re-traumatize someone by having right. them relive their trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. We want them to narrate it, but they don't have to relive it. And even to the point where the doctor asked our son if he was um, scared, if, if the NICU was um, traumatizing or scary. And our son said, no, because if my parents weren't there, and they almost always were, then I had this nurse who really loved me and cared mm-hmm. for me. And, and the, the doctor had him describe the nurse and he described his primary nurse. Wow. To a T. Hmm. And we had one little photograph of her holding him the day he was, um, the day he was released, but we never looked at it very much or anything. So somehow he was able to pull all that together. So it's amazing what can be done. Yeah. You know, and I sat through that thinking, oh, this is going to be like the Dick Van Dyke show when the wrong person gets hypnotized and I'm going to end up quacking like a duck every time (laughs) the phone rings. Right. Yeah. It's not (laughs) like that. It's way not like that. It's not like that at all. And I have another friend whose daughter went through that and um, her daughter being, you know, younger and, and she said it was amazing because she described what a blanket looked like that she had been wrapped in. You know, and it's a blanket that they ended up throwing away. When she is that your house? It that's is. my house. Oh, that's, that's your my house. Grandson. Oh, it is your house. <laughs> that's my grandson. I don't know what's the matter. It's about nap time for him, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I Sorry, everybody. Call. He's oh, usually no. a really happy kid. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was going to say, it's usually, it would be Aaron or me with our kids. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> Adi a few times yelling for me, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. There is hope for PTSD. I mean, oh, ultimately, definitely. that's the thing that yes. PT- PTSD is not something that we have to get, you know, get through. And I mean that in a, you know, in a negative way, it's not like yeah. now you have to live with it. Right. I mean, yes, you, you do have to live with it. You know, you do have the trauma, but there's something that you can do about it. Mm-hmm. And, and the sooner you do it, the better. We are in a great time for that because the the science behind trauma is just exploding right now. Yeah. So this is a great time mm-hmm. to be. It, and really, they're finding out. And I talk about this in my book. You know, now that we can do the um, the CAT scans and the MRIs mm-hmm. and all the imaging 
they are finding that this trauma, you know how people always say, well, it, well, it's just in your head, like it's not real. Well, it is in the brain and it can be seen in the brain that it changes the size of different parts of the brain mm -hmm. and uh, changes the way they react. So it is real. It is real. And mm -hmm. yeah. they're learning so much that treatment is improving constantly. Not okay. the mental health care system could catch up with that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And, and I think you bring up a really good point because how many of us have heard at some point, it's just in your head, it's not real. Oh. No, it is real. Mm -hmm. And that's why, because it's in my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Well, and I hear people all the time that say, you know, I remember one person saying to me, gee, my daughter, they adopted a little boy and he spent his first two or three years living in a cage and he's having a really hard time in kindergarten. Yeah. And I was like, well, I would say you're probably dealing with a trauma issue and I'd get him to therapy right away. Oh yeah. You know, this is a yes. big one. Yeah. And people, then they'll say, well, well, it's pretty expensive. We'll try to get some money saved up for that. And again, it's like, wait, if you found out your child had juvenile diabetes, would you say, well, we'll wait till we've saved up some money before we get him any insulin? Well, I had someone tell me when I told them, um, we had suspected that Oksana had PST, PTSD, but we actually have not gotten a diagnosis for her. But back when we first suspected it, which was a few years ago, I had someone say, still? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Still. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very That was with our, with our son too, you know, when, when he went to his treatment and we had, I remember telling my mother and his step-grandma what was going on and they're like, you mean all that from when he was a baby still bothering him? Right. Right. Really? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's the reality then. A wound is a wound, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. I mean, even from an emotional standpoint, I think about, uh, I think it's John Eldridge that, that wrote uh, The Sacred Romance and Wild at Heart yeah. and all of that. Mm -hmm. And his wife wrote the one for women, but that's exactly what they say. What happened to you in childhood? Because what? You're living it out as an adult. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. he talks about the wounds, you know, like you received wounds as a child and you have been living them out as an adult. So until you can go back, you know, and kind of process those and make sense of that. Now he was obviously not talking about trauma, but maybe in a way, I mean, some of it's those very related. Are trauma, mm -hmm. you know? I remember years yeah. ago, probably in the early nineties being in the Sunday school class and it was some video series and the person on it, and it was about parenting. And this person said, just now, just don't worry because if there's any issue when your kids were toddlers that you missed, if there's any area, you know, that you didn't hit and nail it quite right, you'll have another chance to address it when they hit teenage years. Because anything that wasn't, you know, dealt with then, it's going to come back at with. some point. Yes. And you'll get to deal with it. And that's what, and it, not all of those things are trauma, but it's that same principle. Yes. If it doesn't get dealt with, it's going to have to be later on. It's yeah. going to come out. Pain yeah. has to come out. out. Yeah. yeah. And where our son was treated, the psychiatrist told me, he said, you know, if, if I have a person who comes for treatment in their 30s or 40s, and we can go back and we can deal with all the traumas that they had early, if we hit all the early traumas and work through them, and we miss some of the later ones, that person can go on and have a functional life and they do very well. But if I don't hit the ones that happened early and we only deal with the more recent ones, that person is not nearly, their treatment is not nearly as successful. It's mm -hmm. the early stuff that matters. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, as I think about our family dynamics and our family situations, I think for many of us, we do find ourselves in a situation where our kids might have PTSD, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because of the medical interventions, because of the medical emergencies, mm -hmm. because of uh, frequent falls and really getting hurt, you know, and, um, adopt, you know, adopt adoption, out of an mm -hmm. adoption situation. Um, I mean, there's a lot of situations that do cause trauma that if yep. they were not addressed, you know, that as parents, we could have secondary trauma, or as Erin has said, for some of us, it's not even secondary. It does become a primary trauma. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, for me, it is just a secondary trauma. Um, but we have that, and we one, we need help. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and it's not just we need to talk about it, which we just learned. It's not just oh, I need to find someone to talk about it, but I, I do need someone that can help me process and make sense of it in my brain so that I can function much better. Um, right. 
and getting that for our kids. Now, the one thing that I'm, you know, I'm thinking about is, you know, I have a daughter with Down syndrome, so she has an intellectual disability. And I find that sometimes that population is missed a little bit, like, oh, they're not going to understand and they're not going to get it. However, my daughter is very much aware of trauma. So you mentioned that one of the the risk factors is the unexpected medical issues. And that's something that when we go to the dentist, anywhere we go, we talk about it. Right. We take pictures about it. We try to tell a story about it to prepare her for it. And I think about, she just had a, a sleep study done and we went to see the room, you know, where she was going to sleep. And we looked at all the, you know, the, the things that were going to be put on her. And we looked at some pictures. So although she kind of knew when it actually went on her, it was an incredible traumatic experience for her. I mean, to the point she had one, you know, on her throat that she was like this. And when she was supposed to go to sleep, she turned to my husband because he stayed with her and she said, I'm going to die. And, mm. you know, and you have the you know, nurses and like, oh, she's so funny. But mm. I, she was actually very scared. So in the morning when they finally took everything out, once she had nothing on, she went, I'm alive. And again, wow. she was so funny. But then they called us and we have to do one, you know, another one, a follow up. Oh, no. Yes. And then I thought, I remember telling the doctor and I said, okay, that was super traumatic for her. Is it something that if we wait, it's really bad? Or is it something that we can wait a little bit because mm-hmm. she needs a little bit of time and we need to process it and we need to talk about it and we need to see, you know, maybe, now I know we need to play and do the little, you know, play therapy to kind of help with that, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and Mayo Clinic, they do play therapy with an actual child psychologist sure. to walk kids through the surgery. And we did it almost every time before surgery. And I had someone say, well, she already did it. I'm like, yeah, but hey, as much as I can prepare a child, That's right, right. you know, they play, they make these little dolls and they have the little toys and they go through mm-hmm. surgery. Yeah. So there are things that are available if it's not you know, an unexpected medical issue. Right, right. Right. But even most hospitals that are children's hospitals or university hospitals, the bigger ones, even in their emergency department, in their emergency room, they probably will have a child life specialist on call. And so you can ask about that and get that person in to work with them. And if they can't do it before the procedure, they can help them afterwards. Yeah, right. And now, wouldn't it be great if this really changes and expands to the point that when you recognize that this might be, you know, a trauma triggering thing for a child, that then they also reached out to the parents? Because I feel like there's a lot of things just in general that help children. Yeah. Yeah. But as a parent, we always get to be the observers. So, I I mean, even in a situation where my child really needs to see, um, oh, let's say a, a psychiatrist, you know, and you can't get in to see a psychiatrist for, the long, for a long time. I don't know that a lot of people consider the fact that the parent still has to carry them and they're already at the end of the rope. And then the hope that they were hoping for is not there and they still right. have to continue. Like there, there, there are issues that are traumatic that we deal with as parents too. Yeah. You know, and it's really funny because when I started writing, People were always like, oh, so you write about kids' disabilities and you write about these things. And no, I write for the parents. Well, why? And I still Mm. get that sometimes. It's like, I'm not there advocating for the disabled person or the person with special needs. I'm there supporting the parent. And a lot of times people just don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because how come what you know they're the parents they're the ones that are supposed to be supporting the kids <laughs> like well if mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know that mom or that dad have to be strong and supported and and uh, able to cope so that they can advocate for their kids mm-hmm. and i think this brings up the point that i i feel like um there's a, there's a good percentage of special needs parents that have little to no supports mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. at all to care for their kids with a disability and that leads to a lot of parents unable to deal with a diagnosis for a really really long time right you know looking at a you know diagnosis for their child that's a tragedy you know 
kind of, you, we have a lot of parents who end up stuck, mm-hmm. you know, because you don't have the support, because you don't have any encouragement, because you don't have any help and because you find yourself, you know, in a hole and you can't get out. Mm-hmm. So what if those supports were readily available? What right. if we had professionals that help our children also trained to look for signs in the parent? Could they use therapy? You know, could they use any sort of- If there's anything I've learned about our mental health system and our society in general, it's that we are reactive, we are not proactive. Mm -hmm. And that would be proactive. And proactive takes money and effort and we just don't do that. Mm -hmm. I think I did hear something. I heard a great story, I think it was on NPR maybe, within the last year about a clinic out in, um, in the East Coast where they're training all the people in the clinic to look for not red flags, but pink flags, you know, so things that, and they interview the parents and the kids, you know, what's going on in that parent, in that household or family that could make it too difficult for the parents to advocate for their kids. And then they are trying to provide the supports. I should look that up again. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But I, I think if you looked for pink flags, National Public Radio, you might, mm-hmm. you might be able to find it. Well, you know, it's something that Andy and I have talked in the educational system. Like when a child is finally um, diagnosed with a learning disability, you have to be two grades below. Oh, I know. You know, the grade. And we were saying, so if you can see a steady decline from a child, but they're still not two grades below, you don't provide any support for their child until they fall below even though you know it's going to happen so why are we not helping the kids as soon as we start to see those signs of decline money yes (laughs) well it's the way the law is written the school district can't do anything you know they have to wait for that too oh right right but what i'm saying is i to me that exemplifies the ridiculousness of how we deal with things is like let's wait until things are really really bad yeah then we'll help instead of oh we can see that things are, are beginning to get difficult so let's address it now that's going to be easy and that we can actually help and do, you know, mm-hmm. like you said, to be proactive yeah. instead of reactive. That, yeah. It boils down to that. And I wonder with uh, trauma issues, if that's what it is. So, so if you want to dig deeper into this, there's the freebie. Yes. And then you're going to give links to all of Jolene's books. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm going to have it. If you go to my website too, which is differentdream.com, mm-hmm. it's differentdream.com, and you just go into the search box and you can type in stress or PTSD or trauma, trauma in children, trauma in adults, you'll find all sorts of articles and series Perfect. and different mm-hmm. things about Perfect. it too. Mm-hmm. So to get the, um, the PTSD in children primer, ellenstambo.com forward slash episode 19. And that's the number. Don't spell it out. Uh, ellenstambo.com forward slash episode 19. Scroll down. You're going to see a bright orange button that's going to mm-hmm. say PTSD and children primer. Click on that and you're going to get it in your inbox right away. And remember that you have until March to get 15th. it. 15th. Mm-hmm. Because after that, it's going to be a paid... Re, you know, a paid resource. So right now it's free and you're going to want to get your hands on it. Um, so after March 15th, if you go to the website, I will have the link so you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, but this is when you can get in. So, and again, it'll be a very small fee. So, you know, if you, right. Yeah. And it's just the primer just has like a fraction of what's in the book. Does my child have mm-hmm. PTSD, which really goes into detail more with the research and stories of other families and yeah. lots and lots of resources in it for you to get started. On Excellent. Your there is. So, so we just talked about what PT, PTSD is, PTSD in children, PTSD in parents. Um, it's been a great therapy session. No! We, didn't, yeah. Yeah. we didn't deal with the nonverbal. We stuck with the talk. <laughs> so, that's so that that not is enough. True. That is not enough. And oh, you know what? Jolene. Yes. And you know, because you mentioned that, and you know, we've, we already have a situation where we've had people ask us to bring back um, some of our guests, like Tony mm-hmm. and Tara are probably going to yeah. come back to talk about therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're right we did not even get into the nonverbal. Mm-hmm. So we might have to have you back just to address. <laughs> I'm not a therapist though. <laughs> not I don't know. Maybe my husband will join us and then he'll give his input on that as well. 
yes. if he wants to come and join us. So um, thanks for joining us, Jolene. Yeah, thank well, you thank so you for invi inviting me. This has been just great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and that's a reminder, you know, if you go and get Jolene's primer, you're going to be like, I'm so thankful for the Unexceptional Moms podcast and all this <laughs> great free resources that I, they give me that I'm going to go and write a review for them on iTunes. Or you're going to think, if Ellen asks me one more time, <laughs> for I'm going to scream. So let's go write a review on iTunes. So oh Ellen God. will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And I am going to have uh, links and ways for everybody to get a hold of Jolene. So, and she Thank has a Facebook so group, a uh, Facebook page. So I'll have a link to the Facebook page as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Enjoy your grandson. I <laughs> will. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.